okay, you all quiet down at three o'clock. It works fine. Uh, this lecture is on Austrian capital theory, and uh, that, that's essential to learning about the uh, business cycle of the Austrian school. And I'll do a lecture on that uh, in another day or so, but I'm going to lead up to it so that you can sell, see just how crucial it is to get the capital theory straight and to recognize that other schools of economics just don't see it. They don't, they don't see it at all, and especially uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, and so I show you two views here. One is a Hayekian stages of production model. You know what that is. Uh, and the other one is the Friedmanian, and actually it's Knightian. It comes from Frank Knight, uh, when both Knight and Friedman were at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I would claim that Friedman got a, just a little too much Knight uh, to understand how the, the uh, business cycle works. Uh, we're going to neglect Keynes's animal spirits. Okay, we'll just leave that, leave that aside. Uh, now, start out that one of the reasons that people get confused about capital in Austrian theory or any other theory is that the word capital is used in so many contexts. And so I'll show you a few, and then we'll zoom in on a couple that are uh, at uh, at issue uh, this afternoon. Uh, we could talk about bank capital, that's assets minus liabilities or net worth. Yeah, we know about that. Uh, liquid capital, how liquid is it? Well, that's cash held by producers for future investment. So it's that's the you know, dollar capital. Uh, here's fixed capital, you know what that is, plant and equipment, fixed implies durable. Uh, working capital, that's goods in process, raw materials and semi-finished goods. Uh, capitalized value, that's present value of net future receipts. Okay? So the word is used to mean a lot of different things. And human capital, uh, present value of a skilled worker's future earnings. Uh, Rothbard didn't like the use of the word human capital, uh, and, and I'm not sure just why. I, I think I know, and that's because business firms uh, have to hire people, and the capital that those people have are their capital, not the, not the producer's capital. Uh, but nonetheless, that's still another use of the word capital. <laughs> Now we're going to get serious because I'm underlining things, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and one of them is uh, Frank Knight. Uh, his concept of capital was as a capital stock. Uh, so it's a stock of productive factors that yield a flow of consumption goods. So you'll hear a lot uh, this time about stock and flows. And then you could guess uh, the other one is capital structure. That's the Austrian school, the temporal pattern of heterogeneous producers' capital. Okay, um, and it's a pattern that can change and can change by changes in the interest rate. And the changes based on the interest rate uh, do one thing: if the rates come down because people start saving more. And it does another thing if it's the central bank that pulls them down. One gets you uh, increasing growth, the other one gives you boom and bust. So that's what you want to look for uh, in this lecture. So throw all the rest of them out, and those are the uh, ideas of capital that we're going to work with. Now, there's a problem of measuring capital. And sometimes it's hard to get a, a handle on this. What's the, what's the problem? Okay. And one way of saying it 
uh, is capital is heterogeneous. Now, it doesn't get very far. A lot of things are heterogeneous, okay? So that can't be it exclusively. Another one, let's see. But aren't labor and land heterogeneous too? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So what's so strange about uh, capital? Let's go on. Capital is radically heterogeneous. Now, that sounds like something Ludwig Lachmann would say, okay? And that's fine. But we need to see what it means, okay? So just how radical is capital heterogeneity? So capital is dimensionally capable or, or heterogeneous. It's dimensionally heterogeneous. All right? Now... Let's look at our labor, land, and capital. And I've put in some units here for you to figure out what they are. Not all units of labor are alike. Well, of course, not all units of land are alike. And not all units of capital are alike. Well, so what's so good or what's so strange about capital? And uh, I'll show you what, and you'll be able to see just what. Uh, let's start with the, with labor. Worker hours, that's, that's the working uh, unit. Now, okay, we could talk about unskilled labor or semi-skilled labor or skilled labor, okay? But uh, they're still heterogeneous, but at least we have an idea of what the units are. Uh, and then you could guess what it is in land. We call it acres uh, if you're talking farmland. Uh, and of course, it can be different grades of fertility. It can be uh, terrain. It could be uh, location and so on. But we can talk about acres. If it's residential, then of course, whoop, went the other way. Uh, if it's residential, uh, uh, then, uh, you know, that's another way of looking at it. Now, I'll ask you, what, what are the units of capital? What are those units? And you're kind of hard-pressed to say something. And, I, and I've scoured through a number of, well, I'll say intermediate-level macro books to see what they say about it, all right? So, and so here are a few of them. Uh, they just put units. I mean, <laughs> just take out the parentheses. There are units of capital. Yeah? <laughs> what are the units? You know? uh, well, let's look at even some worse uh, intermediate macro decks. <laughs> what you get doses of capital. That's not going to work. Okay. Uh, <laughs> chunks. And hunks, I'm not a differential. So I, you know, I went to the, a computer and just looked up and see what these things are and, and if, if that can work, okay? So, you know, there you got gallons and you got pounds and said, no, that's not gonna work. There's a dose of capital, okay? There's a chunk. Is it a standard chunk? I don't know. Could be. And a hunk. <laughs> That's human capital. <laughs> so who knows what that means? I think Rothbard's against that too. <laughs> okay. Now, what our focus is on is the Austrians and Frank Knight and later uh, Friedman, right? So you can see what the, the divisions are. Temporal pattern, that's, that's the Austrians. And it's not just Hayek, it's Menger, it's Mises, Schumpeter, Bomberberg, right? It's all about the temporal pattern. You have to have a time element in there. Uh, and it, it, it can change. 
uh, with the interest rate. And it's important what, um, about what it is that changed the interest rate, as I've already indicated. And then stock and flow uh, has a pretty antiseptic look to it. It doesn't, it doesn't have any pattern at all just a stock of it and a flow from it, right? Uh, now, it turns out that that same clash uh, came much earlier with, of course, now Bomba Verk uh, looking at the temporal pattern and John Bates Clark with stock and flow, okay? And I don't, I don't see much of stock and flow that he had uh, as opposed to some of the others in Friedman, for instance. Although I have to say I, I, I have uh, good feelings with Clark, but uh, that's only because he looks just like my grandfather. <laughs> so I'll spot him that. So what about production time in the Clark Knight vision? And it goes like this. You see a bunch of trees that have been set out. And some of them are growing because they've been there more time than others. And uh, Clark would argue, and, and so would Knight, and so would Friedman, okay, that once the steady state is reached, and I underline that, then production time is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. And right now, I'll clue you in that you may not have read enough Knight, but Knight puts quotation marks around verbs that make you wonder. <laughs> Why do you do? And to me, it seems like it, when he puts quotation marks, he's just sort of crossing his finger, like, <laughs> I hope you'll go for that, you know. <laughs> so we'll see more of those. I'll let you look for the quotation marks. Point them out if you don't see them, okay? So trees have a linear maturity structure, actually log linear. You can see the curve a little bit, okay? Uh, each period of sampling is set out and a mature tree is harvested. Well, okay. Uh, look there over on the left. We we'll, we'll start now with year one. These already got set out, okay? Uh, and so there, we've got another one, okay? And then look over at the right and you can harvest that tree, okay? And so you've got a new tree uh, and yet you've got left what you had to start with, all right? Because it's a steady state. As long as you maintain the steady state, there's no time uh, element involved at all, according to Knight and Friedman in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So the next period presents us with the same maturity profile. All right, let's see. If, uh, yeah, see, it grows. It grows again. So that's, that's what you had before. Right? You don't have to worry about time at all. Okay, so Here's a look at, look at the quotation marks, okay? It's the setting out that enables the harvesting. Really? Is that what enables the harvesting? Uh, and what that means, of course, is that somehow if you're just dead set on having a steady state economy with no increase or no decrease, if you just have to have that, then this is what you do, okay? Uh, now this, this one just got Hayek, he couldn't stand it. Uh, setting out the sapling now produces, look in quotes, the harvestable tree, now, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and of course, uh, Hayek says that's just an absurd use of words. That's all there is to it. It can't be true. And there you go. So production and consumption are simultaneous. So do, why, Hayek, why are you worried about the time element? 
It's the same every every time. So this is what the, what Knight and then uh, Friedman are thinking about. Okay, now here's George Stigler, and Stigler, of course, as most of you know, uh, was at Chicago at the time that uh, Friedman was, and Knight was. Uh, so George Stigler defends Clark and dismisses Bon Bever on the basis of the simultaneous simultaneity of production and consumption. We can say that any one row of trees takes 50 years to mature, but since there is a constant output of timber forever, there's simply no point in saying it. Isn't that a strange thing? That's George Stigler, and that's prices in production. No, that's not it. That's production. <laughs> production and distribution theories in 1941. And that's uh, Stigler's dissertation under, guess who, Frank Knight. <laughs> so that's the story. And we'll get one more thing about, uh, about Stigler. Look at this. I wrote my dissertation in the history of economic thought under Frank Knight. He was so strong-minded and so critical a student of the literature that it was a good many years before I could read economic classics through my own eyes instead of his. I have never brought myself to read through my doctoral dissertation, and that's production and distribution theories again, because I knew I would be embarrassed by both the Knightian excesses and its immaturity. <laughs> that's uh, Stigler who said it at a, at a talk in 19... 84, that is, that's it. All right. Now we got what I call a black box capital theory. What's, what's black box capital theory? It's, it's like a flight recorder on an airline. That's the black box. Is it really black? No, it's orange. Okay. It's, it's orange. The blackness is that you don't get to see inside. That's it. You don't just don't look at it. Okay, don't open it up. All right. um, so it's any complex piece of equipment, typically a plug-and-play unit in an electronic system. The specific context about which the user has no need to know. All right. Now, this is a complete analog to the capital stock. Uh, all we need, do not open. So, so that's the idea. That, that's, you don't, don't mess what's in the box. That's, that's the capital in there. Uh, see what we can do with it. Yeah. So you have maintenance of capital. It sort of maintains itself, as you can see, and a flow of consumption. So, uh oh, I, I ought to leave the maintenance of capital there because that is just a technicality. I think that's what that's what you're looking at with the capital stock. The capital stock includes maintenance as a there it is technical detail. Well, of course, it's, it's not a technical detail. I mean, some people would do more maintenance than others. You might do it once a week or once every 10 days, or once every five days, whatever you choose to do, okay, and worries about if, if it goes wrong, maybe you should do a little more maintenance. All right, so it, it's, it's not a technical detail at all. So hence the capital stock is permanent. It, 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 it maintains itself. It's permanent. And they say, you know, I'm saying it puts 
quotation marks every time you turn around. And that, that's actually not always, because he has another way of saying it. Uh, capitals, uh, Gerald O'Driscoll put me onto this years ago, and I keep underlining it in my book on, on night. Here it is, the capital stock is permanent, well, in a sense. <laughs> and then a page or two later, well, capital stock is permanent, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> what else the heck? Oh, capital stock is permanent, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's not permanent. <laughs> We're sorry. Okay. So the permanent capital stock uh, yields a perpetual flow. Can you think about what the qualitations are? In a sense, as it were, so to speak. Okay. So if you go for a night, and that's that's what you've got to uh, get into. So here we are. The capital stock, we've got maintenance of capital, we've got flow of consumption. Okay, so we have a system of capital yielding consumable output. All right. And then he says, but really there's only one factor of production. He thought there were three. There were only one. And it's capital, okay? So human capital, everything. Everything becomes capital. Uh, land becomes capital and so on in the broad sense of sources. So now we've gone to the idea of sources. Okay, because sources are much more inclusive than just capital as you thought it, it was before you realize that really there's only one factor of production and it's sources. Now look at our maintenance of capital. Well, land, labor, and capital are all capital in the broader sense, right? So, maintain, main, maintenance of sources is what we look at. And look at the flow of consumption. Uh, it's the flow of services, because uh, Knight doesn't want to mess with people who aren't producers that nonetheless have things like houses uh, th that yield a return over time, okay? He wants it, he wants it all be services. So you have to think <clears throat> that everybody's a renter or something. Everybody has a service uh, because they own a home, all right? Now, don't try to read this. Don't, don't try to read this. It, it just wasn't, wouldn't work. Uh, well, let's put the sources up and the maintenance of sources and the services. So that's what we got. And I'm going to try to read it for you. <clears throat> I may not make it, all right? <laughs> uh, but to help me and maybe you, uh, I color coded. So you know where the services are and you know where the sources are. <laughs> okay. Now, before I go through this, you'll say, well, why go through all this? All this gibberish. I mean, this is this one is Friedman. It goes over to the next slide, and I'll show you where it comes from. Friedman. So this is Friedman, and so he he's locked into tonight on on capital theory. Uh, okay. Well, I have one blue thing up there just to let you know what it's about. The key feature. Uh, that's Friedman. Uh, and then I, I write, of the process in which interest rates have been lowered. And it's, I put it that way because what they're talking about has been lowered by the central bank. Okay, not that you, not that you decided to, to change your saving habits. Okay, it's been lowered. Okay, so, and so the key feature is that it, tends to raise the prices of sources. Okay, that, that's the orange thing. Of both producer and consumer services. And those consumer services have to do with houses that are rented, okay? Uh, relative to the 
prices of services themselves, that really are services like the maid or something like that. It therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time, I mean, everything happens here at the same time. So you don't have any, any problems during a, a bust, right? Because it all happens at the same time. The direct acquisition of the services rather than of the sources. But these reactions in their turn tend to raise the price of services relative to the prices of sources. That is to undo the initial effects of the interest rate, okay? So nothing really has happened because no time has been allowed for anything to happen. And it, it goes on, it's pretty, let's see. Okay, uh, the final result may be a rise in expenditures all directions without any change in interest rates at all. Interest rates and asset prices may simply be the conduct through which the effect of the monetary change is transmitted uh, to expenditures without being altered at all. So everything just happens at once, essentially. And this is, there's no time for uh, a depression or a downturn. Uh, and this comes from uh, Friedman's Optimum Quantity of Money and other essays. You, you could look it up. Uh, that's a strange thing. So essentially he could have said he could have said okay so much for that Mises you know so much for that Hayek uh, because nothing actually happens all right now despite the fact that they're talking talking about steady state they do realize that things can go awry and you can actually grow or you can actually uh, shrink, right? And so that they show how this works too. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, there's a capital stock. Doesn't get much output, but everything comes back to the capital stock. Gone. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, just let's just look at Knight and Hayek, and might as well say Friedman and Hayek. All right. So it goes like this: Maintenance is a technical detail. Well, Hayek wouldn't agree. Maintenance is a matter of choice. Capital is permanent. No. Capital depreciates, but is augmentable. Right? Capital is the only factor. Capital is heterogeneous and multi-specific. Production time is irrelevant. And production time is a key variable. And boy, is that true in uh, Austrian economics. It's a key variable. It's all about sources and services. It's all about temporal capital structure. It's about stocks and flow, according to Knight. And it's about dynamic market processes, according to Hayek. You can't think of two economists that would be that far apart <laughs> on these basic issues. But there they are. And to me, it's, I don't get it with Friedman. I don't get it that Friedman would pick up on that. And the only thing I can think of is that he was there with Frank Knight and we, and you heard what what was said, uh, what Stigler said about how how he just couldn't read it on his own and had to read it through Knight. As reported in Mark Skousen in his Vienna and Chicago Larry Wimmer, an, an early 1950s PhD candidate at the University of Chicago, reports that Austrian capital theory was one of those subjects verboten in Chicago. All right. 
He says, one of those, what were some of the others? I don't know. <laughs> All right, now let's look at Minger and show uh, what's going on here. He uses the term goods of different orders, goods of the seventh order, goods of the first order. The goods of the first order are consumption goods, so we'll change that to consumption goods. Right? And you have higher order goods. And that, that, that always struck me as strange, higher. What makes it higher? And all I can think of is up there at the top of the screen. You know, that's, that's higher. He called it a higher order goods, so they put the high, highest order goods uh, near the top of the screen. Uh, and, and Hayek followed suit, as you'll see uh, shortly. Right? So there's higher order goods. Now, uh, what we see here is production proceeds top to bottom. Well, how could it not? You can't start at the bottom and go to the top. All right? But value imputation goes uh, from bottom to top. Okay? And some of this parallels what uh, Dr. Uh, Salerno talked about uh, this morning. Now you can see what I've done is just superimposed uh, Hayek structure of production, that's uh, what, page 56 or whatever in, in the structure of production. Orders of goods, all right. And this, this thing is sort of strange. It took me a long time to wonder, well, what is that Minger thing and the, now the Hayek thing are strange? And what's strange is, is that you have time coming down the horizontal axis. Uh, well, okay, but there's nowhere else in this world of economics where time goes downward. <laughs> Always goes upward, but it, got, it goes downward. You, you might think that it crashes at the origin or something. And at the bottom, uh, you have consumer goods that are flushed out, okay? And that's, that's sort of odd, too. I'll clean it up a little bit. That's, that's just Hayek now. There it is. Okay. Now, I worked on this to sort of fix it. Because I didn't like this time coming down, and I, and I worked on it quite a while. Walter Block uh, told me I did a good job. Okay, so <laughs> let's see how it works. There, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> okay, so so the time goes left to right, as you would think, and the consumption comes out at the right, as you would guess. Okay. Uh, now, there's a, a more stylized triangle. Well, it does, it's not a stylized, that's the triangle. Okay, when you talk about the Hayek and triangle, it's just really the blue part there, or purple, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, Hayek and triangle, yeah. Okay, production time is a sequence of stages, we get that, right? Now, you might all be thinking, if, if we're dealing with the capital structure, isn't that really a simpleton thing, a simpleton way of looking at it? Geez, but at least you have uh, the time element there. And if you really think that's just too simple for you to play with, then uh, go to pure theory of capital instead of prices and production, and here's what you'll find. <laughs> so you'll be better off with the with the purple triangle, okay. Okay, here we go. The structure of production, I think I've got time now. <laughs> Capital-based macroeconomics disaggregates capital to enter temporally. Consumable output is produced by a sequence of stages of production 
the output of one stage feeding into the input of the next. Uh, the temporal, temporally defined stages are a, arrayed graphically from left to right. Uh, the output of the final stage constituting a consumable output. Right? So there's the triangle in stages. At least we put the stages uh, back in. And uh, there's uh, somebody at the early stage. It looks like he's on the ball, knows what he's doing. Uh, late stage. Now that guy's kind of loafing and doesn't have any customers, but they'll show up. Okay. Late stage investment activities is exemplified by inventory management. All right. Now I put this in here. This is a a factory. Uh, it says main gate down here, and you see the main gate over there, and you'll see a sign that says "You are here." If you've ever gone to look at you, you are here. Right? But what's missing is one that says "We are here," <laughs> and the point the point is that that almost any factory uh, would be producing things that some go one stage and some go another, and you're not quite sure because you haven't read prices in production. You don't know what is where, right? So they wouldn't be able to tell you where it goes. It might be ball bearings that are, that go to, um, that go to mining, mining equipment. Uh, and also go to skateboards. <coughs> Is that early stage or late stage? So it's really, you can't sort it out uh, at the industry level. For pedagogical convenience, the initial capital structure is shown as having five stages. With growth, the number of stages will increase. Well, okay. So while all five of these stages are in operation during each period, resources can be tracked through the structure of production over time. And let's see, let's watch, watch that. Watch the goods in process. There it is. Oh, this is a note here. Uh, Henry, let's see, uh, Hayek introduced the triangle in 1931 when Henry Ford was still producing a Model A. Uh, if only Hayek had had PowerPoint, he could have shown how the abstract triangle uh, aligns with real world output. Okay. But we can do that here. <laughs> and, that, and that's just to, to show you that, that the Output doesn't fall out of the bottom, okay? It, it comes to the right. <laughs> Together, the sequence of stages form a Hayek in triangle, a summary depiction of the economy's inner temporal structure of production. In an economy experiencing secular growth, the triangle increases in size, but not or not necessarily in shape. And that is, it'll, it'll increase in size if people are saving, right? And it'll, it'll change in shape if they decide to save more or save less. That's what it, that's what it meant. Watch to the, watch the structure of production expand. And here you can see it expands. People must be saving, but it's it's the same general shape as the triangle. When people choose to save more, the change in their preferred temporal pattern of consumption is registered by the market, the first and foremost by reduction in interest rates. And let's see, reduced current consumption frees up resources in the late stages, which then can be employed in the early stages. I should say, which some can be uh, employed in the early stages. So it looks it looks different. Let's see.
So what's the structure of production respond to an increase in saving? All right. So sure enough, see when Cain saw that, he didn't have a triangle. So when he saw that people saved, that means they're not consuming. Well, how? If they're not consuming, why would we be producing? Right. And Hayek says, says, realizes that no, if they're saving, that changes the interest rate and it makes uh, it makes production better, more profitable. So in Hayek in theory, increased saving results in a, a reallocation of resources towards the early stages of production. Here are the differential interest rates sensitivities are are at work. The Nidian theory in Nidian theory, increasing savings beyond capital maintenance requires uh, requirements result in an increase in the capital stock, but with no implications about capital's temporal structure. So that's that's what's lame about this. You can get a big capital stock, but uh, it's not spread out just right. An increase in output of consumer goods emerges over time as the, as the early and intermediate products move through the more time-consuming structure of production. So now, now that you have saving, uh, you can increase faster. We can see clearly the critical difference between Knight and Hayek. If you burn through the casing of the, of the uh, Knight in black box, we see the Hayek, Hayekian temporal structure of capital that allows for differential interest rate sensitivities and hence reveals the market mechanism that tailors production plans to the intertemporal preferences. If the interest rates are telling the truth about people's willingness to save, it gets genuine, sign, uh, uh, sustainable growth. If interest rates are being held down by the central bank, we get an artificial boom followed by a bust. So that's the end of this one and the start of the boom bust cycle uh, when I do a, an, another view. Okay, there, there they are. Thank you. <laughs>